Hello everyone, welcome to Fiction Domain. This is part 2 of what if Naruto had Wolverine's powers. Kura Nai stared at Naruto's file. It was thicker than she expected, and the blonde orphan had apparently had assessments performed by Lady Senju Tsunade and her apprentice, a clanless prodigy named Shizune, apparently the niece of the Sanin's lost fiancé. Master Jiraiya had also placed a few notations and recommendations in the file as well. The veteran Kunoichi, as reluctant as she was, knew better than to set a task she knew was unfair, and was carefully flipping through the file before she and Kakashi went to meet their genin teams. The first page detailed Naruto's academic grades, which were better than others might have thought. Apparently the boy had some kind of deal with Tsunade, based on his scores. If he'd been able to nail that last jutsu, she had to admit, he'd have more than qualified for the slot on her team. Next, she looked at his tracking scores. Visual tracking was pretty good, but was hardly a patch on Hinata's, and his hearing was also sharper than she'd thought. The real trick came down to his sense of smell, and she knew no one could beat an Inazuka in that regard, it was impossible. In truth it was, but Naruto's sense of smell at least matched Kiba's, according to the file, although it was to be noted that he didn't have as much experience as of yet. Apparently it was part of a newly emerged Keke Jenke. Kura Nai sat up straight as the information struck home. Turning the page she continued reading, even as her face paled. This was an S-rank secret, if word got out that Uzumaki Naruto had two Keke Jenke, the village council would slap him into the CRA faster than you could think it, and that would definitely be a clan restoration act problem. The first Keke Jenke was the main Uzumaki bloodline, heightened vitality, longer lifespan, faster healing and sharper senses, with the potential for their special chakra to develop. Unusual manifestations, such as the chakra chains of Uzumaki Kashina. Kuranai had to reread that line five times before it sank in that her Janin sensei as a genin had to be Naruto's mother. But then who was the father? Was he the source of the other bloodline? Shaking her head, the genjutsu mistress continued to read. Abducted from the hospital three and a half years back by Orochimaru, discarded as a failure by same when experiment appeared to fail, awakening of second Keke Jenke from assimilated transplanted tissue, escaped and finally taught by Senju Tsunade. If someone was telling a lie, or selling a story, they would have come up with a better one than this. Sealing the file again, she put it in her personal safe, which seemed to be her fruit bowl. She stood and hurried towards the academy. If she got there after Kakashi, she'd never live it down. Naruto's entrance to the classroom that morning was a surprise in more ways than one. None of his classmates had expected him, although Hinata had prayed he would at least stop by so she could finally return his jacket. Not that she wanted to, but three years was long enough for her to dream, and at least now she felt confident enough to. The whole thing came to a head as Kiba spotted the boy although everyone else did too, as he was the last to arrive before Aruka sensei Hey, Naruto, the Inazuka boy taunted, I thought only those who passed were supposed to be here. In answer, Naruto pointed at his forehead. There was a gleaming Hite 8 there, on a dark orange band with white tips like a fox's tail, dangling down his back. He then spoke up, Kiba, I had a special job to do for the Hokage, that needed me to seem to fail. It was the official version of what had happened that was being circulated around the village. I can't say more than that. It was perhaps predictable that Sakura leapt to her feet from her spot next to Sasuke. Ino, on the other side of the boy, joined her. In the back row, Nara Shikamaru shook his head. That much hotness on either side, and the boys still emo, he mused as the girls opened their mouths in unison. Then again, considering how much, or little, they actually think. It was true Ino was a fraction better at most non-academic things than Sakura, but it was a small fraction. The two, rivals for Sasuke, began to screech, and Naruto slapped his hands across his ears, muffling the sound from downright painful to merely annoying. From the looks of it, they'd hit the right frequency to irritate Aburame Shino's Kakaichu colony as well. Naruto, how dare you lie like that? If there was such a job, it would have been given to Sasuke. Hinata was seeing red, and everyone else was staring at Ino and Sakura, who they'd never have believed could be that much in sync over anything. 
She was actually red, not with embarrassment this time but with fury, and was gripping the edge of her desk so she wouldn't go over there and many punishments flitted through her mind, but she couldn't settle on any one of them. Sasuke was partially in shock. This was mostly from being at ground zero of his two biggest fangirls explosion but partly it was from Naruto being given a task he had not. The tense atmosphere was broken by Naruto, breaking into laughter. Hinata lost her grip on her temper as he clutched his side, and now Sasuke was beginning to go red with anger, before Naruto managed to stop. Oh, yeah, that was a good one, he chuckled. Looking up he called out. You all saw and heard that right? Hey, I think the next three classes in each direction heard it. Doesn't anyone else find it hilarious that Sasuke's two biggest fans, his two most ardent supporters, wanted him to fail? There was a moment of time when everything seemed to halt as that realization worked its way across the classroom. As it reached the aforementioned fangirls, some of them smirked at Sakura and Ino for making that slip, others glared at Naruto for pointing out the problem with their thinking, if you could call it that, and finally Ino and Sakura went white as sheets. Snow White Ones, freshly laundered. As they drew breath to scream again, the most unlikely event ever happened, stalling the vengeance of the pair. Sasuke chuckled. Hey, it wasn't loud, but he definitely chuckled, and he still had the remnants of a grin on his face. Heh, heh, it happened again, twice more, before descending into full-blown laughter, that had Sasuke clutching at ribs that had grown unused to such effort. Naruto grinned as well, as the fangirl horde was shocked speechless. That, that baka Naruto had made Sasuke laugh, for what had to be the first time in years. It was beyond belief. Eventually, even as Aruka sensei entered the room, having caught the laughter and raised voices, Naruto stepped up beside Hinata and sat down as the Uchiha heir wiped his eyes clear of the tears laughing that Hard had brought on, still chuckling now and then. He wasn't Naruto's friend, not by a long shot, but pointing out the fallacy in Ino's and Sakura's argument had definitely earned him points. Without further ado, Uruka began his announcements. First, I'd like to welcome you all to class. You may have noticed that I'm your only sensei today, and for those of you wondering why, the events surrounding that explanation have been classified in a rank secret by the Hokage. Moving right along we have 10 genin squads here, and we'll start by placing those of you we can. Team 1. As Aruka called out their names, the genin moved into the appropriate groups. The first three squads were announced in proper order by Aruka. There was, by long-standing custom, no Team 4, because nobody wanted to be part of any group marked by death. Team 5 and 6 were oddities. 5 was an all-boy squad, while 6 was all-girls. Team 7 consists of Uchiha Sasuke and Sakura Haruno, with an open spot to be determined, led by Hitaki Kakashi. Team 8 has a similar problem, with its set members being Aburame Shino and Hayuga Hanada, led by Yuhi Kuranai. Inazuka Kiba and Uzumaki Naruto will be filling one or the other slot based on a Janin Sensei determined test. Team 9 is still in circulation from last year, so next we have Team 10, Nara Shikamaru, Akamichi Choji and Yamanaka Ino. The lineup bothered Ino, and all the fangirls except Sakura, but there was little they could do. As for Team 10's lineup, it seemed their parents had managed to convince the Hokage that another generation of the odd yet effective trio their clans made was a good plan. Once all teams were assigned, Uruka dismissed the class, with an admonishment to be back by the end of lunch to meet their respective Janin. Naruto scratched the back of his head. I wonder what that's about. He turned to the girl who was his closest, if a little shy and awkward, friend. He'd noticed she wasn't wearing his old jacket, and was curious about why, but felt this wasn't the place to discuss it. As the other fresh genin left, most of the girls glaring at Sakura and Naruto, although for very different reasons. The six members of teams 7 and 8, even though two of them were undetermined, were unsure of what to do. With their rosters up in the air like that, it was difficult to even think of bonding as a team. It was all to the good, then, when a few minutes later, Yuhi Kuranai arrived with one of her friends, Kiba's older sister Hannah, and her canine partners with her. I'm Yuhi Kuranai, teams 7 and 8 are to come outside with me, she announced, trying to at least be neutral in her attitude, 
although a touch of her true attitude seeped out regardless. Hitaki Kakashi will meet us in the yard by the gate. With that brusque introduction, she turned and walked out. As they were walking outside, Naruto slipped up beside Hinata and whispered his question to her. Hinata Haim, he murmured, hoping in vain that neither of the two with the sharpest senses, Shino or Kiba, would catch what he said, you're not wearing the jacket I gave you. What's wrong, is it too small now? I mean it was three years ago, and it can't have been comfortable in some places. A quick glance, stolen as he rubbed the bridge of his nose with his index finger, told Hinata that Naruto, her Naru-kun, was, blushing. Then she remembered exactly where the jacket hugged her tightest, and she too turned red. They were outside by now, and she didn't have the time to explain, so she just held the small bag she brought the jacket in question in, and whispered her reply. I, I'll tea tell you later, Naru-kun. Kuranai-sensei is about to speak. Indeed, they had been joined by a tall janin with gravity-defying hair and his hit a eight pulled down over his left eye. Kuranai didn't comment on his, for once, punctual arrival, since she knew he'd left hours before her to get here. As the janin in dispute, she had to take the reins here, so she stepped forward. The reason we are standing here is due to a minor dispute over which Jenin gets placed on Team 8, which is being set up as a tracking and reconnaissance team. As a result, the Hokage has told me to test the two potential Jenin before the final determination is made. She paused for breath, and looked over the assembled Jenin. Hinata, Shino, the two of you are free to train or speak as you wait, but we will not be leaving until your teammate, whoever he is gets back. Team 7's Sasuke and Sakura, the same applies for you. Turning to the last two genin, she smirked, Kiba's experience would stand him in good stead here, she knew, but then Naruto's physical stamina would also help him. The test is as follows, she told them. Somewhere in Konoha is Tora, the cat belonging to the wife of the fire daimyo. As she said this, Hana winced, and Kakashi shook his head in pity for the genin even as he admitted that the Genjutsu mistress couldn't have come up with a better test. The two of you are to track him down, capture him, and return him here by sunset. The first one back gets the spot on Team 8, and the other is placed with Team 7. Before you start, a few rules. No outside assistance. This means Akamaru stays here with Hana, Kiba. To be fair, however, no shadow clones for you, Uzumaki. The difference in address wasn't something she noticed, but Hinata did. The test applies only inside the walls of Konoha, and no interference with each other will be tolerated. I have two friends who'll be keeping an eye on you both, and they will inform me of any offenses against each other. This is Tora's scent. She held up a scrap of silk that had obviously come from a cat's bed, allowing each boy to sniff it twice. Begin. As he raced out into the village, Leaping to the rooftops as he'd been taught, Naruto's mind raced. Kiba had been using his sense of smell for this for a long time, but he hadn't. If he wanted to get this, he had to think about what was going on, and according to everyone, it wasn't his strong point, he was in no way anywhere near Shikamaru, for example. Heck, he probably thought more like the cat than Shikamaru. A moment of revelation was all it took. Dashing to the first place the cat would have left his scent, Naruto began trying to recall which hotel the fire daimyo's wife used when she was here. Kiba knew he had this in the bag. He too understood the laws and customs surrounding clan symbols, and had started to worry that Hinata would never see him as a possibility for a boyfriend. And then today she hadn't been wearing Uzumaki's jacket, which he just knew meant she was starting to see things his way. As Kiba leapt and raced around, he wondered why the scent wasn't just jumping out at him as it usually did and at the unusual lightness of his head. Oh, well, surely Akamaru would let him know if he missed anything. Akamaru, but he'd left Akamaru with Hana back at the academy. Oh, this was going to bite. In the shadows, two figures had split up, one following Kiba, and the other watching over Naruto. In about 30 minutes it would be time for their first obstacle. The blue-eyed Jinchiriki emerged from the hotel, sniffing gently at the air by the fence as he worked his way around it, soon arriving at the point the runaway cat had walked, and began to follow the old scent. He wasn't good enough to guess how old, and as he moved on, he kept a wary eye, and ear, out for, something. He wasn't sure what, but this seemed too easy. 
It was. Kiva was finally able to pick up a scent of that cat, dratted nuisance. And it was less than an hour old, too. As he dashed forwards, his mind drifted towards how happy Hinata would be to have him on her team, and so he missed the slight whistling sound. The flasks of concentrated peppermint had been supplied by Hana, and the people throwing them were Kurunai's friend Midarashi Anko, who was following Naruto, and an old Chunin squad mate by the name of Sodaitora Shinshi, who Kiba never noticed until far too late. At the same time, in totally different districts of Konoha, Naruto and Kiba responded to the ambush in very different manners. Naruto had a fraction of a second to react, whoever that was, they were fast, and reached out and snatched the flask from the air, stopping the open top with his thumb to prevent the contents from spilling on the street, and managed not to break the fragile glass bottle in his grasp. That had been close. Channeling Chakra to his senses, he moved on, unaware that his whisker mark were now glowing faintly with his chakra. Kiba, totally caught by surprise as his thoughts drifted away from his surroundings, also managed, by some miracle, to catch the flask thrown at him. Unfortunately, with his mouth, and the peppermint sloshed into his mouth and throat, pretty much killing his sense of smell. Gasping and choking, the Inazuka marked his current place, and hurried over to a nearby hose to try and rid himself of the smell of peppermint, a smell so strong that it blocked his sense of smell completely. As Naruto picked up the pace, moving more quickly once he again had the trail, sniffing every so often as he ran, he swept through an area with a vague whiff of peppermint to it. If someone was obliterating sections of Tora's trail, he reasoned without slowing, he had better move even faster. When Kiba finally got the dratted taste and stench of peppermint out of his mouth and nose, he darted back to the place he'd marked, and cast about to get the scent once more. He caught Tora's scent after a few minutes, because another scent, much fresher and stronger, had overlaid it, that of Naruto. A few seconds of anger had Kiba growling, until he hit on a really shinobi plan. Let Naruto do the work, then swoop in and grab the cat, then beat the baka back to the academy. It was so simple, it couldn't fail, and then, forcing his mind back to the now, he set off. Yes, Naruto's scent was easy to follow. Shinshi sighed, and swiftly caught up to Anko. Pretty snake, the hound is hunting the fox instead of chasing the cat, he said in a deep low voice. Orders? The special Jonin thought for a second. Leave it, it is a legitimate strategy, even if it's not a nice one. The chase continued. The afternoon was dragging on as Naruto closed on Tora's position, some bushes in one of Konoha's many parks and gardens. As he did, he heard the faint rustle of leaves, and presumed it to be his watcher. Moving slowly forward, one foot at a time so as not to startle the runaway cat, he crouched and slid closer. Kiba had nearly lost Naruto a couple of times that afternoon, a frustrating experience considering the other boy wore orange for crying out loud. He'd soon picked him up again though, through a few moments sniffing around, but making up the lost ground had the Inazuka tired and grumpy. He'd finally caught up, and he too could smell the cat in those bushes. Naruto, the baka, was cautiously approaching the cat from the windward side, letting the stupid creature, Inazuka and cats did not get along, catch his scent. Kiba, however, had worked his way around until he was upwind of the cat, with his own scent blown away from the feline that had led them this merry chase. But if Naruto got there first, Kiba didn't stop to think, he didn't feel a need to, and he raced in to grab the cat. Tora was getting bored, he'd run away again, but there was no one chasing him to put through hell until he found these two. The first one, the one who was showing him he was there, that he was nothing to fear, he smelled odd. Like a fox, but not like a fox. It was confusing, and Tora was wary of confusing things like this. And vets. Always watch out for vets. Then there was the other one, the dog smelling one. He was hunting, but he didn't smell nice to cats. He made Tora's whiskers itch. He'd lost track of him now, and looked around as he heard Kiba's rush begin. Instinct took over, and the cat bolted away from Kiba, straight into Naruto's arms, where the young Jinchuriki immediately cradled him to be comfortable and placed another hand over the top to secure him as he jumped. Straight over Kiba as he barreled from the shrubbery with his arms outstretched, and from the tree limb he landed on Naruto was off to a nearby roof, 
still cradling the now scared cat which had sunk its claws into the arm of his jacket as he raced back to the academy. Kiba was not happy, and began to chase Naruto across the rooftops, wondering how the blonde could just keep running like that. He'd been going all out all day and was barely breathing hard, by the kami. Whereas Kiba was most definitely slowing down, and realized he could either keep shouting threats at the other genin, or shut up and run, but either way he couldn't catch up. He'd lost, and all he could do was take it. He snarled, partly at Naruto, but mostly at himself. His former classmate had earned this, after all. And now that Kiba thought about it, Hinata probably would prefer Naruto on her team anyway. Well, maybe she'd thank him for making the Baka work for it, and if she ever changed her mind, he'd still be her friend. There was always hope, right? He didn't realize he'd spoken aloud until he heard the chuckle of the Chunin behind him. Indeed, there is always hope, Inazuka-san, the man said as he stroked his goatee-style beard. Combined with the bald head and the Chunin vest, he looked almost villainous, but in a cool way. Hope is all there is that cannot be taken from you. It can only be cast aside, and even then, there are those who will carry it for you until needed again. I am Sodaitora Shinshi, Inazuka-san, also called Gentleman Tiger, and I bid you good day. The deep voice and almost formal manner of speech distracted him, and the man was gone from right in front of his eyes. Hayuga Neji had arrived while Naruto and Kiba were undertaking their test, and on hearing what was going on, had reported to Hiyashi and the Hayuga elders. They had taken it upon themselves to see what came of this, and sent an elder with two branch house bodyguards as well as Hiyashi and Neji, to see that Hinata's teammate was, worthy. It didn't help that the elder they sent was a close friend of the deceased Inazuka Kujo, Kiba's father, who had been killed during the Kayubi's attack. Although not by the Kayubi, which the Inazuka didn't bandy about much. So as Naruto came up the road, at a slow jog, stroking Tora's fur gently as he ran to reassure the now comfortable feline, he was greeted by the sight of six Hayuga clan members, as well as Kurinai Sensei, Kakashi Sensei and Shino, as well as Sasuke, who was leaning behind a tree, and Sakura, who was staring dreamily at Sasuke. For such a smart girl, he thought, she can sure do some stupid things at times. He turned his gaze on Hinata, who'd clasped her hands together as she saw him, a smile brightening her face, and although the sun was setting, it was as though it had sprung back into the sky as far as he could see. Kuranai watched as Naruto jogged in, petting the cat that existed to make Genin life a living hell, and shuddered, a motion that was not missed by Hinata, who had never heard tales of the cat. Neji didn't speak about things with her very often, or at all, as the red-eyed Kunoichi nodded to Naruto Enko appeared behind him. He ran fair, and passed the obstacles without help. He's pretty good, Shinshi says the other Gaki needs work, but he'd probably be better off as a fighter with tracking as a secondary speciality. Grinning the woman in the trench coat, mesh and miniskirt disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Turning to Naruto, she swallowed her pride, and extended her hand. Well done, Uzumaki, and welcome to Team 8. Before Naruto could say anything, Hinata's temper finally blew. Striding past her family, which surprised the Hayuga no end as she wasn't hesitating in the slightest. Nor did she seem to care that others were not only present, but watching. Hiyashi felt the urge for some popcorn. Placing herself before her new sensei, she exploded into an angry rant. Kuranai sensei, she hissed, enough venom in her words to give the Jonin real pause, even as Kiba finally jogged up to the academy gates. I don't think you really mean that. I think you feel forced and badly done by to have him here, when the truth is you should be fighting to keep him. I don't know why you wanted Kiba on the team, but I do know why Naruto should be her. He has drive, determination like no one else and you should be ashamed of yourself for treating him like the rest of the villagers, the narrow minds that can't stop blaming him for something that I'm sure he didn't choose. He helps others every chance he gets, did you know that? He stands up for anyone who needs it, and even when he has to fight someone, he tries to help them afterwards. Sasuke nodded at that, with a grunt, as he recalled their fights at the academy. He sees the bright side of everything, he works hard, and when people laugh with him, his smile could light the room. He is Uzumaki Naruto, a part of this team now, 
and if you insist on calling him, Uzumaki, then I insist you call me, Hayuga. It's about as polite. Everyone was staring at Hinata during this rant, and as it went on, Naruto had looked around for confirmation. With each point someone else nodded, although apparently only Hinata had seen the true smiles he apparently used. Sasuke had actually given a wry grin as she mentioned the part about making others laugh, at the same time as Sakura blushed. As each person nodded, Naruto's smile got wider. It was a true smile, as Hinata would have put it, not a mask to hide pain, or to keep others away, but a beacon of good feelings to be shared. As he realized this, Hinata stopped talking, and looked around, realizing exactly who she'd been speaking in front of. The shocked adults of the Hyuga, the bitter and glowering face of Neji, the placid exterior of Shino, and the general look on everyone's face that seemed to say they'd have found a wolf being mauled to death by a fluffy little rabbit to be easier to believe. She brought up the bag that had Naruto's old jacket in it, even as he murmured in a low tone, tell it, Hanadaheim, and tried to hide her face behind it as she went bright red, and struggled not to faint. Kuranai felt like the world was upside down. She'd just been verbally mauled, and deservedly so, by a genin she'd had charge of for less than six hours. She bowed at the waist towards the two genin and spoke clearly. I'm very sorry, Naruto. I was too wedded to what I'd heard from others, and jumped to an unfounded conclusion. When she straightened up, she walked over to Kakashi and handed him a stack of coins. Here's your 20 Ryo, Kakashi. If you buy another Icha Icha book with it, I'll have my new team hunt you down and burn your mask. As the two teams separated, Shino leaned in towards Naruto. Why do you think he wears that mask? He asked his new teammate in a level voice. Naruto thought a moment before answering, still gazing at Hinata. As much as he reads Aero Senen's books, it's probably to hide his nosebleeds. Straightening as Hinata spoke to her father nervously. Sorry Shino, but can you excuse me? I just remember Hinata-chan said she needed to talk to me. With that, he made his way closer to the girl with the midnight hair. I told you, daughter, he or she was saying as Naruto approached. It was all well and good to play at it for the last few years, but if the elders are to make you a good match. For a change, he was interrupted by his child. I am sorry father, but time has gotten away from us. I was going to explain things but events came up to postpone the telling. If you can give me a few minutes. A few minutes for what, Hinata Haim? Naruto asked, startling and eep from her as she startled. This was embarrassing enough in front of her whole clan without actually having them hear what she said. Taking his hand, she led him away from everyone, but took great care to remain in full view of them all. As she did, Naruto found himself caught up in how soft her hands were, before he realized she was speaking to him. Um, sorry, he muttered. What was that you said? Do you remember the jacket you gave me, Naruto? He snorted. Of course he remembered it. You've only worn it every day since, Hinata, he replied. Until today, of course. Is there something wrong? It's definitely too small now. If you want I can get you another one? Hinata very nearly passed out from excitement, but managed not to buy the barest margin. Taking a deep breath she continued. Hi, Naruto-kun, it is too small, but please let me finish, okay? At his nod she went on. You know the spirals on the shoulder and back of your jacket? Again he nodded. Those are clan symbols your clan symbols, and the only people allowed to wear them are the active duty Chunin and higher shinobi, to honor a treaty as old as Konoha itself, and the members of that clan. Naruto nodded again. He had a vague memory of Tsunade saying something along those lines, and his curiosity was piqued as Hinata began going red again. Studying it, he saw that it started at her jaw and spread upwards and down from there. A tiny part of him began to ask how far down, but the rest of his mind bludgeoned it into submission. Well, if you give someone your clan symbols like that, you're asking them to join your clan. If you g give them t to an UNM married girl or w woman, I'd c can b be t taken as a m marriage p proposal. Naruto noticed that that cute stutter she used to have when she was nervous was back, meaning she had to be really nervous. He went pale and looked over at Hiyashi. Why you m mean? Hi, I-P-P-P, -p -p. hi, Hinata was pushing her index fingers together now, 
and why your d dad hi naruto's eyes rolled back in his head in a moment he would never live down and he fainted naruto woke up panicking looking around anxiously there above him was hinata's concerned face and although his pillow wasn't her lap with the other hyuga nearby perhaps that was just as well blast it struggling to hammer the piece of his mind that kept thinking that way down unfortunately it was as irrepressible as the rest of him and kept getting up again the blonde jinchuriki gradually sat up the pillow had been that bag hinata had been carrying around today and he realized where his old jacket was by the strong smell of her coming from it he or she was the closest hyuga and oddly much at odds with the expression on his face seemed amused that couldn't be right could it pushing this mess from his mind and shaking his head to clear it naruto cast his mind back over the conversation surreal as it was before he passed out oh please kami he prayed in earnest don't let sasuke hear about that his prayer was already too late of course as ino had been passing the academy gates on an errand at exactly the right time to pick up that choice piece of gossip he turned to hinata who was wearing a worried look on her face it's all right hinata haim he said a sheepish smile on his face i i think it was just the shock of all that news at once sorry for worrying you the pearl-eyed kunoichi smiled are you sure you're all right naru kun she asked it wouldn't do to find he'd been badly hurt later that would be awful when he nodded she let out a sigh of relief now she could keep speaking with him although her father was close enough to hear it had to be done and hadn't she just chewed out her own sensei in front of this group and both teams she could and would do this naru kun she began slowly certain that he hadn't known about the symbols and consequences while i i liked the idea that you really wanted me to be part of your clan your family i knew why you didn't fully understand what you were offering as a child i could play at it and your old jacket was a source of comfort and strength for me but now the clan is looking to strengthen itself and as such i have tea to do my part as much as i wish otherwise i must return your jacket she was moments from tears they were already gathering in her eyes ready to pour down her cheeks then she felt a gentle finger brush across her right eye then her left softly brushing away the impending torrent startled she looked up staring into the depths of the most sapphire blue eyes she had ever seen even as naruto spoke softly fully aware that hayuga hiyashi hanada's father and therefore not a man to cross if he could avoid it was listening to every word so the jacket's too small then he said in a matter of fact tone as if he were discussing the weather or the crops there was a light a spark deep within those eyes that she had only seen there before when he was discussing ramen from ichiraku's i'll just have to get you one that fits then her gasp of surprise was shocked from her as she brought her hands up to cover her mouth as she blushed surely he didn't mean b but naru kun now that you know she began only for him to cut her off yeah i know he said low but firm i didn't then but i do now and if i had known maybe i'd like to think i'd have done it anyway but back then you were just the nice girl who never heard me little place in the sun even in the darkest reaches of my mind the image of the sewer like construction where the kayubi was imprisoned came to his mind's eye replete with the odd incongruous ray of sunshine so now i know and i'm still offering but if the very thought hurt him but although he didn't know much about love he was only 12 after all he knew that having something that hurt him was preferable to something that hurt her the clearing of hiyashi's throat reminded them that they were not alone boy the head of the hyuga nearly growled his voice was that deep and low rumbling with menace what makes you think i or my clan would in any way permit this farce It was phrased as a question, but it had all the hallmarks of a threat, and Naruto didn't respond well to threats. Snapping his eyes to meet those of Hinata's father, he glared, refusing to back down, despite the heavy dose of fear trying to climb his spine. Naruto drew on his knowledge, from what he could remember, of what he'd learned involving his mother and her clan. It had been tiny tidbits, gradually gathered over the years and pieced together bit by bit. If his past was a jigsaw puzzle, it was one of those big ones, and he had more than a few large patches of picture, as well as the edges. 
There were other sections, involving his father, but he couldn't figure out where they fit, exactly, so he left them out of the picture as he worked. And now he brought it to bear. My name, he stated. Uzumaki, part of a treaty as old as the village. Hinata had told him that herself, before he'd passed out. The Keke Jenke of that clan, which grants sharp, clear senses and unmatched vitality. That information had come courtesy of Tsunade and her tales of his mother, as well as comments that compared him to her. A heart and will that will not quit, that will never surrender. A mind and soul that will always overcome, no matter how many times I fall I will rise again. I will be Hokage someday, believe it. And then there's this. He moved his arm so that his hand was between him and Hiyashi, blocking the view of any other than the head of the Hyuga clan and his teammates and sensei. His claws slowly extended, and the eyes of those who could see it widened. Another Keke Jenke, I was informed. It emerged during my absence from Konoha. I was abducted, and experimented on, by a madman with snake's eyes, and nearly died there. I still have nightmares. Hiyashi looked at the boy with his Baikugan active, assessing the odd alloy that seemed to make up his very bones. Hinata suddenly recalled the dietary supplements Naruto had taken before every meal she'd ever seen him eat since his return. Four dull gray pills that obviously didn't taste very good. Shino and Kuranai were speechless, although for the Abarame boy, it would have been hard to notice. So, Hiyashi-sama, said Naruto, all serious now, a far cry from the troublemaker and prankster that he heard of, equally far from the only other real concern that he had. Is that enough to satisfy your clan? Two Keke Jenke and the Uzumaki name? Or are they going to be greedy? Hiyashi grimaced inwardly, but his nigh legendary reserve kept the expression from his face. For my clan, it might be. I don't particularly care. If Hinata chooses to accept, she will be removed from her position as heiress. The matriarch of one clan cannot be the head of another. Her place will be filled by Hanabi, and those symbols may be the only thing that can keep both my daughters unsealed until I can mend the clan. Naruto was bothered somewhat by that statement. Unsealed? He asked. Without his noticing, his hand crept across his belly, a gesture that neither Hiyashi nor Hinata missed, although they forbore to comment. What do you mean unsealed? The Hyuga head glared at the boy, then waved Neji forward. Show him the seal, he ordered. Neji glared at Naruto as he removed his Hite 8, and the silk band beneath it. Hiyashi continued, The Byakugan is a potent tool and a great advantage for Konoha, he explained. As such it was decided that the Hyuga who were to become Shinobi would receive a seal that would preserve it against our enemies. That is the origin of the branch house. Somewhere along the way, the branch house became the servants of the main house, and the seal was, altered. This seal can be used to inflict pain, as well as sealing away the Byakugan at the moment of death. He waved for Neji to return, and as the boy stepped back, he again glared at Naruto. Hinata was returning his glare, not that he seemed to care. With Naruto knowing the connotations, he still offered her his jacket, a dream come true for her. She'd already pinched herself several times to see if she'd been placed in a genjutsu, and she was not going to let her Naru kun down. Naruto, for his part, was locked in thought for a good few minutes. He could see a few problems with what he'd been told. Hiyashi-sama, he asked, could you correct me if I'm wrong, but if the seal activates at the Hyuga's death, and it's known to do so, what stops the enemy from removing their eyes while they're alive? He shivered at the thought. As for the seal, maybe it would take a master of Fuenjutsu to remove, but, surely it wouldn't be so hard for an enemy to find the key to cause the pain. Wouldn't that very crippling lead to more live captures, and thus a greater risk of the loss of the Byakugan? Hiyashi was impressed. In a matter of seconds, this boy had seen a major flaw in their perfect seal, one that was now revealed as nothing more than a means to subjugate the branch house. That could give him an excuse. This boy might just enable him to heal his sundered clan, and that was a priceless prize. Very well, Uzumaki-sama. He said the formal mode of address startling Naruto and Hinata. She may wear your symbols, and I shall contact you at a later point to arrange the blessed event. Your enemies will be mine, and my family yours. The Hyuga head then shocked the elder behind him, as well as Neji, by bowing to Naruto, 
touching his forehead to the ground, before rising to leave. For a moment he paused, and softly spoke. My daughter, Hinami would have been proud of you, as am I. Shino had a lot to think about that night, as Kuranai had told them to be ready at 8 the next morning at training ground 8. He spent the time as he walked home quietly pondering what was happening with Naruto. Hinata wearing her classmate's jacket had been a running joke for the past few years, and a few unkind children had been known to joke that she'd still be wearing it at her wedding. Civilian clans didn't adhere to the same customs as shinobi clans, such as the impact of offering your clan symbols, so their lack of understanding was explicable, if crass. He reached the Abarame compound, where his mother sat on the decking at the side of the house staring out at his father as he and his Kakaichu colony trained together. Shino took note of the economy of motion, the precision he used, with little if any wasted effort, and idly wondered if he'd be that good someday. Then he remembered Hinata's rant at Kuranai Sensei and smiled a little, the expression concealed by the high collar of his coat. He would, oh, came his mother's voice and he realized she was even closer than he thought, having moved in while he was distracted by his own thoughts. A smile on Shino Kun's face? Something big has happened then, something positive. I know, today you were assigned to your team, and the matchups are something you consider near perfect. Happy with her deduction, Abarame Hotaru waited for her son's response. The Abarame, like many other clans, strove for perfection, but with what Shino had witnessed today, he had come to a different conclusion. Perfection seems overrated, he murmured, causing his mother's eyes to widen and his father to halt his training session. The raised eyebrow of Abarame Shibi invited his son to explain. Perfection itself is an end to strive for, but never attain, making the goal worthless, and the striving itself the key. Upon attaining perfection, you stop growing and stagnate. Once you stagnate, others surpass you. Rather than strive for something that becomes worthless once I attain it, I would strive instead for the strength to protect my friends and teammates, so that my goal and my striving both have a worthy purpose. Hotaru was certain it was the most that Shino had said in one go since he was six, and the thoughtful look on her husband's face told her he was pondering Shino's words deeply. After a moment he nodded. You're right, he said, and the quiet family watched the fireflies his mother was named for come out to dance. Naruto would not hear of Hinata going home after they'd been dismissed before he could get her a new jacket, one he insisted would be of the right size, and so he took her to the store where he got most of his clothes. Kujaku Dansei was a tailor with a small clientele, and he'd long ago been quietly instructed by the Hokage to make sure that Naruto always had the clothes he wanted. The old man still remembered the day the boy had seen his first picture of a tiger, and the amazement on the boy's face when he was told that few people saw the tiger that was hunting until too late. He had no tiger skins, and the tiger stripe pattern would have been out of place on the boy anyway, but he came up with the basic outfit that Naruto had worn for years. Dansei was a former shinobi, too old now to run as he used to, and had turned to his hobby to make a living. He was good at it, and when his granddaughter had chosen to apprentice to him for those skills, rather than as a shinobi, he'd been proud. Now that same granddaughter was helping him with the measurements of Hayuga Hinata, and Naruto was asking the man's opinions. The symbols had to be there of course, on the shoulder and back, and Dansei knew what that meant, politically speaking at least. He made the garb for ninja grade durability, yet cut it for comfort, and as young Zuzushi, Zuzu Chan to friends and family, called out the alterations, he marked them on the jacket. His skill was such that mere minutes after the measuring was done, almost before Hinata had dressed and returned with Zuzu Chan, Dansei's little masterpiece was complete. It was nearly identical to the old jacket, but with a feminine cut to accent the waist and shoulders, and a little inbuilt support for robust activity. The blue of the old jacket had clashed somewhat with the midnight hair, but by shifting a shade or three closer to purple, that section instead added to it in a way defying description. The orange was a little darker than his jacket, too, but not so much that Hinata's fair skin became pallid. Rather, it gave her a healthy-looking glow, although that may have been the girl's joy at being told she could wear the symbols, even with Naruto knowing what it meant. The moment he'd said he'd understand if she didn't want him, her heart had almost shattered, until she realized he was giving the choice to her, in case she didn't want him. 
as if that would happen. Her new jacket drew much attention that night at dinner, and her father's lack of comment told the clan he at least approved, though there were soft mutters all night, spiteful, hate-filled things. As the meal drew to a close, Hiyashi raised a hand for attention. Today, I approve the match between Clan Uzumaki and Clan Hyuga, that has been in negotiation for the past few years. The noise as elders bolted upright and began to shout in protest, or to demand the girl be sealed before she was wedded, was as nothing to the cold, ice-filled tone that the head of the clan wielded as they bickered. Enough, he hissed, and silence fell. Glaring about the table, his eyes were everywhere but on his rapidly reddening daughter. Hanabi looked puzzled, and Neji had that cold look of disdain on his face. Are we the strongest clan in Konoha, or a posturing schoolyard mob? As the elders forced themselves to self-control, he went on. Further, due to drawbacks in the caged bird seal, I have elected to discontinue the practice. He or she took advantage of the apoplectic silence that ensued, even as that odious elder from earlier that day tried to squawk as he rapidly turned purple. It was pointed out to me that the seal only triggers on death, so should any of our enemies take it in their heads to harvest the eyes while their donor is alive it would not seal them. Further, the seal's key for inflicting pain is far easier for a fuenjutsu wielder to determine than the removal, so an enemy with sufficient skill, of which there are many, can pose a significant threat in battle with a single hand seal and the right amount of chakra. I am certain no one here wants that. He pointed to the Hyuga seal master, an old man called Kanshoku. Begin at once, he ordered, before any could countermand him. By the end of the week, I want no Hyuga in Konoha vulnerable to an enemy with that key. As he sat, he smiled behind the mask of his own face. That should keep their minds off the whole question of Hanada. He didn't miss that the Hyuga who'd protested loudest were also the ones most fond of using the seal to enforce compliance, either. Even a startled, almost shocked Neji, his usually stoic face a confused mess of emotions, couldn't avoid the thought. All this, because of one little jacket? Naruto couldn't sleep. The events of the day and the previous night had him wired, almost literally bouncing with energy, and so he sat at the beat-up old desk in his apartment and wrote a letter to Tsunade, telling her of the events. He realized he might not be allowed to send it, or not all of it, so he took it to the Hokage Tower to see if he could get Gigi-sama to look it over. Maybe she could help him out, too. After all, she'd known his mother. Hiruzen skimmed through the reports from the various janin who had been chosen to sponsor the Genin graduates this year. Again, as he'd suspected, from the ten squads he'd assembled, only three were ready for the duty and burden of shinobi status. That was appalling. From past years that he'd investigated, at Jiraiya's urging, he knew that prior to the Kyubi's attack, the academy had been producing twice as many able squads. So where did the competence go? Was the sabotage deliberate, or just coincidental? Removing the civilian side of the village council was not the answer, as the exact same makeup of the council during the Yandaimi's reign was effective. So was it the people involved that caused this? Disaster wasn't a strong enough word, but it would have to do. Or were they, too, being manipulated by some dire puppet master? He picked up the reports for teams 5 and 6. They were capable enough, but their teamwork was fragile. They would require another year to temper their teams at the academy, but with Mizuki gone, who would teach them? Sighing he scanned Team 7's report. Pass. That was all Kakashi had written, but it was enough. He was using the bell test that Minato had used on him, that had been used on him by Jiraiya, that had been used on him by Hiruzen himself. In the comments were the words, post not needed. That was a first. Every team had one member who wound up tied to the post, in the second stage. For it to be unnecessary implied that the test was complete before it got that far. The Hokage chalked it up to the Inazuka boys' pack instincts. Once those kicked in, there would have been little hope of failing them, as his example would inspire the Uchiha, which left the Haruno girl stepping in, unlikely to abandon her crush. He could almost see it in his mind. Kakashi must have been impressed. This was the first team he'd ever passed. Team 8 was a foregone conclusion. 
Kuranai's report was more detailed than Kakashi's, but finding her recon and tracking team had taken the initiative to map the unfamiliar training ground before she arrived as a teamwork exercise. That was very good, very good indeed. Team 10 was passed, if barely. Here is inside at the terse notes, his son was a little lackluster, a little unfocused, for what he was doing. Perhaps a Chunin assistant would light a fire under him. He reached into one of his drawers and took out a file. There was this Chunin, who'd applied for advancement to Jonin. Assigning the youngest of Konoha's four gentlemen to the task was a great test for the rank. That also gave him an idea about the academy problems. He scrawled out the message to assign Sodaidora Shinshi to assist Saritobi Asuma, and two others to send to the other gentlemen to see what they could do with the academy. Sometimes the best thing to do with a problem was to throw it at another. Naruto's shinobi identification photo had just been taken and he wandered down the tower to his appointment with the Hokage regarding his clan finances. A little investigation told him that even from just his mother's clan, he had more than enough for his own compound, not unlike the Hyuga, but he didn't want something that big unless there was no other choice. As he entered the room, he saw the Hokage was not alone, but he hadn't expected him to be. Hayuga Hiyashi was present as an interested party, having agreed to Hinata's engagement to the young Uzumaki, and Kuranai was present as his sensei, and thus de facto advisor. The other three, though, he couldn't understand. This was starting to smell serious. Choosing a sturdy chair, Naruto bowed to the Hokage, his sensei and his prospective father-in-law, but didn't sit. Hokage-sama, he said instead, I can understand my sensei's presence, and that of Hayuga-san, but I am unfamiliar with these others. Am I permitted to ask why they are present? A meeting now concluded, so that we may get on with my clan's business? Here is an openly smiled at the boy's formal and precise words. To think Naruto, the village troublemaker, christened by the Anbu who'd been on the receiving end of his pranks until the abduction as the village Pita, or pain in the A. Acronym, had this inside of him, ignoring the glares that the, advisors, from the council were leveling at the boy, the Hokage answered Naruto by introducing them. These are Shimura Danzo, Maitokado Homura, and Yutatane Kaharu, advisors from the village council, Naruto-san, he said establishing protocols by the address during the introductions. Naruto turned and bowed to them, not as low as he had to Hiyashi or Kuranai, whom he'd honored nearly as much as the Hokage. It is an honor to meet them, the blue-eyed shinobi said, I have heard so much of them already. He smiled, a false one that didn't fool anyone, nor was it meant to. I do hope your meeting with Hokage-sama was fruitful. Inwardly, Hiruzen wished he could break the reserve and laugh at Danzo being played like a top by this boy, barely a sixth of his age. They are here for your meeting, Naruto-san, he gently corrected, playing along. The council seems to feel their advice will be needed. Why? Naruto asked. I can see Hayuga-san's interest in the matter as my future father-in-law. He still swallowed hard at that. He just couldn't wrap his mind around the thought. And Kuranai-sensei is here to give advice. While we got off to a rocky start, I trust her to look out for me, and for Hinata-chan. But what exactly does private Uzumaki business have to do with the council? There is a matter of a loan that must be repaid, Homura said after Danzo looked in that direction. The village finances are very important. Naruto may have been a knucklehead, but he was not a fool. That sentence had been carefully constructed to make it sound like Uzumaki owed the village. I offer you a deal, Maitokado-san, he said. The interest on the loan gets paid on time, and brought up to date, and I don't call in the debt. The elders stared at the boy, wondering exactly how much he knew. As they did, Homura cleared his throat, nervously. I agree, he said. There was nothing else to say, having backed himself into a corner. The glare he directed at Naruto did not seem to phase the boy, who then turned to the Hokage. Was that all they needed to know, Hokage-sama? As Hiruzen nodded, the boy again turned towards the village advisors. I am so pleased to have been of assistance to the honored elders, and thank you for dealing with this promptly. Now there are more personal matters to deal with, boring trivialities and clan contracts to finalize, so I beg, do not let us keep you from more important issues. 
As the elder advisors left, reluctantly but they did leave, Naruto held a bow at the exact degree that gave them just enough respect that they couldn't call him on it, but not enough that they would think he actually respected them. Once the door was closed, he nearly collapsed in the chair. Do we have to be formal for the rest of this? He asked the Hokage. My face feels like it's going to fall off from the fake smiles. Chuckling, Hiruzen shook his head, and the small group began to discuss the future of the Uzumaki clan, and its past. The meeting was almost over. Naruto had found that being the heir to the Uzumaki clan presented him with a couple of properties within Konoha, one of which was ironically the very apartment building he'd been living in all this time. Hiruzen had simply set things up so the rent paid by the few other tenants went directly into a stipend for him keeping him in groceries and other essentials for quite some time now. Of course, finding he'd been overcharged in those places that did sell to him, with a few exceptions such as Kujiku clothing and Yanagi blacksmithing, leaving the boy to live off ramen, was unforgivable. Especially since he needed a good diet to help his bones form properly now, even with the supplements Tsunade had supplied him. They could be prosecuted as sabotaging a ninja candidate of the village, if Naruto revealed his Keke Jenke. Of course, then the easily manipulated council would slap him into the CRA. He didn't want that, he hadn't even kissed Hinata yet. Realizing that the girl in question's father was right there, a few seconds after having said this, froze Naruto on the spot, a nervous grin on his face, as Hiyashi raised one eyebrow. Hiyashi knew it was going to happen eventually, and was resigned. This was the way things were going and he planned to step down as clan head as soon as Hanabi was ready for the position. He didn't feel right, even after abolishing the caged bird seal, as he himself had used it before, and against his own brother. His announcement to that effect had not been well received, by the elders or the branch house, but he was adamant. The only person to lead the clan had to be one who had never used the seal. Returning his regard to Naruto, he let the boy squirm for a bit before speaking. Then you had best do so, hadn't you? He pinned Naruto with his gaze. You will tell her about your prisoner, of course. There will be no deceiving her there, and I doubt she will mistake the container for the contain. The date we shall set once you both reach Chunin rank, but I do not wish to be a grandfather for many years. Do you understand me? The red that had washed over Naruto added a counterpoint to his nervous confirmation. Then our business has concluded. Hiyashi's departure was cordial and informal, and Kuranai left shortly after, informing Naruto that tomorrow afternoon would be their first mission, AD rank, which was all they could receive until they'd accomplished a certain number of them, but training would occur in the morning, this time at training ground 37. Naruto himself was about to depart when the door slammed open and a short boy around 8 years old in grey shorts and a blue leaf emblem t-shirt, wearing a scarf and a skullcap, charged at the Hokage with a kanai. He didn't get there, luckily, tripping over his own scarf and tumbling over himself. If Naruto hadn't snatched away the boy's kanai as he fell, he might have removed his own pancreas. Springing to his feet, the boy looked around and pointed dramatically at Naruto. The whole attitude, combined with the sheer level of energy the boy seemed to have, reminded Naruto of someone. Someone he knew well. Now if he could just remember who. It was you, wasn't it? The boy demanded. You tripped me and intercepted my assassination technique. You're good. Naruto tilted his head to one side in amazement at the wrong conclusions this child was leaping to. As if, he retorted, letting his normal self emerge. Two hours discussing the history, finances and politics involved with the Uzumaki name was more than long enough to be serious, he felt. You tripped over your own scarf, kid. From the lofty perch of four years older, Naruto was starting to enjoy this. So why are you attacking Gigi-sama? The boy blinked at him. Is he your Oji, too, then? But I don't have any cousins. Here is inside. Naruto, this is my grandson, Sarutobi Konohamaru. Kono-kun, this is Uzumaki Naruto. I believe you two share a goal. Naruto nodded, picking up the way the conversation was going. So you want to be Hokage, too, then? Look, I know Hokage-sama here isn't my grandfather, but for a long time he was the only one who seemed to care about me. So I call him Gigi-sama. It says I think of him as family, but still shows respect, get it? 
Konohamaru nodded, he did indeed get it, but if you want to be Hokage, why are you attacking him? Because the Hokage is the strongest, and if I can beat him, I have to be the strongest, right? Konohamaru seemed uncertain. That is true, came a prissy voice from the door. A tall, thin man dressed in the standard Jonin garb, with a bandana covering his hair and a pair of dark glasses that he pushed back up his nose, stood there. Honorable grandson, you really shouldn't run off like that. How are you going to get strong enough to become Hokage quickly if you don't follow my teachings? Before the younger boy could answer, Naruto planted himself in front of the strange Jonin, glaring. Isn't it rude to break into a private conversation without introducing yourself? he asked. The stranger glanced at Naruto, assessing him quickly as his eyes traveled swiftly up and down the genin, and just as swiftly dismissed him. In a haughty tone, he spoke, introducing himself as if bestowing a favor that Naruto was in no way worthy of. I am called Ebisu, an elite Jonin tutor for the honorable grandson of the honorable Sandame Hokage. Naruto tilted his head one way, and then the other, with a sniff of the air between. When you put it that way, he said, noticing the disdain this man was treating him with, obviously judging him by the demon he was said to be. You do realize that those words actually tell me absolutely nothing, don't you? Naruto's next words cemented him a place as one of Konohamaru's favorite people ever. There's no honorable whoever here. There's Gigi Sama, and there's Kono Kun. He paused as he looked over his shoulder at the younger boy. I can call you that, right, Ototo? At Konohamaru's awestruck nod, he turned back to the Jonin. This is how you introduce yourself, and I should know. I was taught my manners by Senju Tsunade, and when Tsunade Sama teaches you manners, they stick. He drew himself up and bowed, just a fraction, keeping his eyes on Ebisu. My name is Uzumaki Naruto, head of that clan and genin ninja of Konohagakure no Sato. Relaxing a little, he stood upright and glared at the Jonin again. Now, what do you mean, become Hokage quickly? Kono kun has to do it the hard way, just like all the others did. There's no quick path to Hokage. Konohamaru stared at the older boy. What? No quick path? But then what am I supposed to do? How do you become Hokage, then? Naruto turned to face his new friend. Like I said, the hard way. Being Hokage is no easy thing, just ask Gigi Sama. It's mostly hard, dirty, thankless work. You have to know that going in, and it takes the strongest people to shoulder that. Naruto paused. I don't really know why anyone else chose to become Hokage, but I know why I will. There are people who are precious to me, and others who are precious to them and others precious to them. It goes on from that. If you become Hokage for any reason other than to protect them, all of them, the ones you know and the ones you don't, the ones you love and the ones you can't stand, well, then, you're chasing the wrong hat. He grinned at the obviously angry Jonin, and if anyone says different, they're selling manure as chocolate. Having other things to do, Naruto strode from the Hokage's office after saying his goodbyes to Konohamaru and Hiruzen. Upon leaving the Hokage Tower, he made his way to his second property, a modest house and garden compound bordering the Hyuga estate. It was a decent house, in a similar style to the Hyugas, just smaller. It was dusty, not having seen any use in a long time, but a few dozen cage bunchen with brooms and mops and cleaning rags soon had the place looking brand new. There was easily enough room for a large family, with several rooms suitable as bedrooms, as well as an office, a good-sized kitchen, a laundry and a very comfortable bathroom, with a tub that was more than large enough for two. Blushing as that thought ran through his mind, and once more striving to ignore that part of him that kept trying to bring up the subject, he made another pass through the house, measuring for furniture at a later point. Maybe he should ask Hinata for help there, since she'd be living here in a few years. Maybe less if they made Chunin early. Shaking his head to clear out the thoughts that brought to mind, Naruto left the compound to return home. He was watching the stars, and his mind drifted a bit, considering the future as a pleasant thing, and he missed the signs of an ambush until it was almost too late. Perhaps it was the reddish glow over the other buildings and the smoke pouring into the sky, dulling his senses with shock as he realized that was his home on fire. The scent of the first rushing assailant was heavily laden with sake, 
and he obviously thought a 12-year-old, demon, brat, to be an easy target. Naruto heard him at the last second, and began to turn as the shovel haft was laid across what should have been the side of his head, but was actually the back of his skull, with crushing force. Not even the new material of his bones altered the laws of physics, and the power behind the blow cartwheeled Naruto to one side, although not as far as otherwise would have been the case. Blood flying from the wound in his scalp, even as the shovel broke, the loud crack resounding through the night. There was a pause as the attackers stared through their drunken haze at the broken shovel, then raised their improvised arsenal and closed in. It surprised them to find Naruto already on his feet, the wound across his head from the broken shovel closing and sealing already, healing before their very eyes, which gave them pause. The blue-eyed genin poured his chakra into the jutsu he'd worked hard to learn that night when he'd taken down Mizuki, screaming out, Taju Cage Bunshin no jutsu, as he did. He used more than enough, and didn't notice, or brushed off as imagined, the fact that his whisker marks glowed blue with his chakra as he did, a small army of shadow clones appearing to trap the mob. By the time the Anbu squad arrived, it was all over. A dozen grown men were trussed up like chickens, awaiting their fate, and Naruto sat against the nearby fence, staring at the smoldering remains of his home. It hadn't been much, but it had been his, and someone had egged on this band of drunks to take it away. He wondered why it didn't hurt more, why it wasn't sinking and that it was all gone. Maybe he needed somewhere he felt safe for that, but he couldn't imagine where. Then her scent hit him. Hanada, she was here, and he began looking around to find her. She was there, standing in her sleeping kimono, having taken the time to throw her new jacket on over the top with a handful of other Hyuga including her father, and she saw him at the same time, rushing to him and clutching him close. He could feel it now. Here, he was safe. Here, he could let it all go. Here, in her arms, he could weep for what he had lost in his life, not just his home, but his childhood, and he would be safe here though a war raged close around them. As she held the sobbing form of her intended close, noting he was a fair bit heavier than he looked, Hinata stared at what had been his apartment. She felt Naruto's sobs slow, and descend into a fitful slumber, one that smoothed out as he snuggled closer to her. There in that apartment, he'd lost most of what he owned. She knew he kept Gama-chan, his green frog wallet, on his person at all times, but everything else, including the gifts she'd secretly left for him over the years, had been in that building. As a hand closed on her shoulder, she looked up into the stern and foreboding features of her father's face. For tonight, he said, sympathy in his low-pitched voice, but not his face, he comes home with us. He was warm. That was the first thing he noticed. He was warm and safe, and he realized he was not alone. Opening his eyes revealed to him a humble bedroom in pale colors, with a few exceptions. The first was the old orange jacket that was pressed behind glass and framed, like some oversized flower. The second was a pile of neatly folded clothes on the desk, freshly laundered, that looked like his. Finally there was the last, a stuffed toy that looked handmade, a chibi fox plushie, but one that had been modified with spiky blonde hair, on its head. It looked a little out of place, and Naruto at first didn't realize why. When he went to rise, and he discovered the arms around him, he realized pretty quickly that the space normally occupied by the soft toy was currently occupied by him, and the warm, tight embrace that didn't want to let go of him was Hanada. He was so dead when Hiyashi-sama found out what was happening. He spotted movement in the doorway, and feigned sleep. Through the cracks of his eyelids, he saw a Hayuga girl, no more than eight years of age, peering through the open door with a shy and puzzled look on her face before turning to someone else, in the corridor beyond his line of sight, and asking the burning question. Ni San, who is Nei Chan's new plushie? Naruto immediately realized that this must be Hinata's sister, and wished he'd made a better introduction than as her cuddle toy. An instant later, he spotted her form of address and a few thoughts ran through his head. I didn't think Hinata had a brother, he thought, his mind both racing, and yet striving to prolong this happy place. He hadn't had the nightmares, neither the old one or the new one he could never remember. Then he remembered the Hyuga boy who'd made Jenin the previous year, her cousin, he thought, who had often spoken up when it was time to go home, who the shy girl, 
a squeeze from the arms now holding her against his back reminded him that she wasn't so shy anymore, had referred to as, Ni San. Wasn't Neji always angry at everything and going on about fate? As the boy stepped up to the doorway, he spotted Naruto. A grim smile reached his face. No one to worry about, Hanabi-sama, he said grimly as he stepped into the room, since he's going to be dead soon. The blonde Jinchuriki stiffened in fright, and was about to leap up and run away, when the most beautiful sound he'd ever heard came from behind him. Hinata's somewhat sleepy voice. Neji ni san, stop it, she said. Tu san knows where Naru kun is. The arms reluctantly let go of him, and the sheets moved as Hinata sat up. His home was burned down last night, and we had to bring him here. He was asleep, and wouldn't let go of me, so Tu san left him here, but there was supposed to be someone to chaperone us. Another Hyuga, one of the ones from the previous night going by Naruto's sense of smell, arrived in the corridor. I'm sorry, Hinata-sama, she said, bowing. I had to answer a call of nature. As Hinata wasn't holding him anymore, Naruto figured this to be as good a time as any to wake up, and began to go through the motions of it. But that didn't last long against the Hyuga eye for details. Hanabi giggled at his attempt to mislead them. This Naru-kun had to be the Naruto her chan had always spoken of, and that meant he was this Uzumaki father had accepted for her at dinner the other night, unless there was some other Uzumaki in the village somewhere, which she doubted. Don't bother pretending, she said, with a Hayuga-style grin, the corners of her mouth barely quirking upwards. I've known you were awake since I saw you. I'm sorry to hear about your home, if there's anything I can do to help. Hanabi's sincere gesture was a big step up from how others had always treated him, and Naruto wasn't entirely sure how to deal with it. A moment's thought, and a rumble from his belly, distracted him. Breakfast is in five minutes, Neji said, confused as to why this boy was held in such high regard by his uncle. He was trying to find something stable in his constantly changing world, and somehow the immutable rock of fate had turned out to be a pile of sand. From what little he could find out, this boy was the center of the spiraling maelstrom that life had become, and he couldn't wrap his mind around that. How could this boy, a year younger than he, cause such chaos? Naruto nodded, and sat up, abandoning all pretense that he hadn't been awake. With Hinata's words, he'd remembered last night's events, and the safety he felt in Hinata's arms. Now, he had to do something that may just cause her to turn away from him. He had to tell her about the Kyubi. If you would, can you go ahead, please, he said, a serious note in his voice. Hinata was about to climb from the bed when his hand caught hers and tightened on it. There's something I have to tell. Hinata Haim. For the first time, he used the name he had only ever used to speak to her with others. A deliberate choice to show how much he thought of her, his princess. As the others nodded and left the room, although the appointed chaperone didn't go far, stopping just beyond earshot, he turned to Hinata. Hinata Haim, he whispered, not wanting to speak loudly and he had her full attention. What do you remember from classes, about the Kyubi no Yoko? She was a little surprised. She'd been expecting him to apologize for crying on her shoulder, or for putting a burden on her, not a history revision. It attacked the village 12 years ago, no, 13, now, and was defeated by the Yandaimi Hokage. The wry grin on his face said she was right. Yeah, and a lot of people forget that, defeated, doesn't always mean, killed. Of course, the Kyubi can't be killed that easily, no matter how strong the shinobi is. But the Yandaimi did, at the cost of his own life, manage to seal away the Kyubi, so it couldn't threaten anyone. She saw this was hard for him to say, and waited patiently for him to continue. The problem gets bigger. He couldn't seal the Kyubi into any old object, it had to be significant, and someone had destroyed all the sealing jars that could have been used he said, just as Jiraiya had told it to him. Anything else would have been consumed trying to contain the fox's demon chakra. So he had to use a living creature, so that the chakra could be channeled through a chakra network, and that meant a human being, as nothing else would have one complex enough. And it had to be done as the basic chakra network was forming, so that the network could adapt to its presence and not cause chakra poisoning from the incompatibilities. He was really glad Tsunade and Shizune had taught him medical terminology. 
so he sealed it in a baby, born that very night. Hinata was stunned. She was a very intelligent girl, very nearly a match for Sakura in the academic scores, and she could see the inevitable conclusion. The Yandaimi Hokage was such a man that would not ask of another what he could not give himself, she'd learned as she grew up. Her two San had always said so, and she'd heard similar thoughts expressed by others. So when her Naru kun mentioned the baby, she knew that the baby was himself, and more than that, he could only be the son of the Yandaimi. At no point since the attempt to abduct her when she was a child had she been so terrified. Naruto saw the effect, and smelled the fear, and began to reluctantly turn away. So it came to him as a great shock when she grabbed him, pulling him close against her in a deep hug and he turned his face towards hers. At the same moment Hinata had hugged him, pressing herself against him to reassure him, she murmured into his ear, before it turned. Oh, my poor Naru kun, that's terrible. But he hadn't heard her, or he had and it simply hadn't registered, as his head turned, and she turned hers to look him in the eyes. With both faces so close, the awkward angle meant they had to tilt their heads a fraction, and their inexperience at being this close to another gave them no distance to judge by, and their lips gently brushed together. The burgeoning couple froze, lips against each other, for a good minute before they leaned back, parting reluctantly, both reddening in a by now familiar manner. Um, yeah, Naruto babbled, his voice faint, even as that one part of his mind beat the rest into a confused daze, and screamed out how good that had felt. Oh, yes, breakfast. He stood quickly, accidentally dragging Hinata with him as he did, and went to step over to his clothes. Since she hadn't let go of him, this led to the two of them sprawling on the floor in a startled heap, much to the amusement of their chaperone. For a moment they lay there, Hinata savoring the sound of Naruto's heartbeat even as he discovered how much he adored the smell of her hair, before he broke the silence. Thank you, Hinataheim, he whispered. Raising her head, she stared into her fiancé's eyes. She just loved being able to use that word for Naruto. Why, Naru-kun, I haven't done that much. Shaking his head as they struggled to their feet, and gathering his clothes to get changed for breakfast, he smiled. That's not true. You accepted me, even knowing about my furry passenger. You were and remain my best friend, and when you held me last night, here he blushed as much as she ever had. I didn't have nightmares, because I knew I was safe. When I was abducted back then, I was experimented on, and I was dying and met the Kyubi deep inside my mind. The place was terrible, a real sewer, and there was only a single ray of sunlight there. A ray of sunlight from a girl I saved from bullies who apologized for a reminder, and thanked me. Turning he returned her embrace with a hug of his own, the first real one he'd ever given. Now, I better get changed for breakfast. Yamanaka Inoichi stepped out of the prisoner's mind, and gave Ibiki the identity he needed. As the scarred man started cursing, he gathered the news wasn't good. That man died last night after these men were caught, he said. Choked to death on a fishbone, apparently. Someone is entirely too good at setting up a chain of events and cutting the links we really need. Growling, he began the report for the Hokage. With manipulation and conspiracy on such a scale, the whole thing was being arranged at a much higher level than he was currently equipped to deal with. Team 8's first D-ranked mission was the acquisition of furniture for Naruto's new house. Apparently, the Hokage provided both the mission and a budget. One supplied by the originally reluctant insurance company, who'd quickly changed their minds when the Hokage pointed out that not paying up could be considered theft from an active duty shinobi, and would hardly inspire others to use their services, maybe even costing them customers. Kuranai assigned them all roles based on their capabilities. Hinata got to match the furniture's styles, and was good at it, while Shino and his Kakaichu ensured that the pieces were not subpar rip-offs. Naruto, with his abundance of shadow clones, got the task of moving the purchases around the house until Hinata told him it looked right. In less time than he'd originally thought, he was moved in. It had been a whirlwind of a day, and once all the training in the morning and events of the previous night and that afternoon caught up to him, Naruto was glad the day was done. He even decided to treat his team and sensei to Ichiraku's to celebrate. 